This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Mafuma. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Do you ever feel like life is a never ending series of lessons while you try to find purpose, meaning, and answers? I am Vanessa Fontana, the host of Figuring Shit Out, a podcast where we undertake self help, coming of age, and healing. As I live my 20s in New York City, figuring shit out myself, I've realized that if you spend your whole life trying to get your act together, you don't have a life, you have an act. On Figuring Shit Out, every Sunday, you get to normalize the journey of not knowing and be guided into living your life with more intention and ease. Once again, folks, time for another edition of Thursday Coast. And Fox must know that we, they must know about Thursday Coast. Otherwise, why else would they schedule the Republican debate on the eve of Thursday Coast? Just so your two favorite political commentators can talk about (laughs) the debate that was on Fox the night before. Um, Joining us as always, founder of Daily Coast, largest online Progressive Community, founder of Civics for the Q, and the host of the ever popular podcast, The Brief. Marcos Melitzis is here. Hey, buddy, how are you? Doing good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So, about last night, that was uh, long <laughs> and, and 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 crazy, man. It was. I don't even know. I'm trying to figure I, out how to even describe it. Surreal, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I will say, Mark, that it was, it was, um, parts of it were obviously incredibly painful in hearing, you know, just the Mike Pence wax poetic about Jesus and, uh, in a political context, uh, in a very politically cynical way was, um, you know, was very grating. And Vivek was, obnoxious and um but there are some real interesting dynamics that emerged that i did not quite expect and so um it's me i think it's a much more interesting race um uh, now after tonight more interesting than it was before and a big part of that was was donald trump not being there and i think that was a huge huge miscalculation on his part and would make a difference in the end i don't know maybe not but uh, it's, I think it's actually created an entire new dynamic in a race that, um, that, uh, should prove interesting in the, at least in the short to midterm. So you think, and I, and I see you've written about it as well. You, you feel that Mike Pence came out a winner. Uh, uh, it, it hurts to say it. I cringe when you mention it. Absolutely. It was actually really? kind of shocking. And now, you know, I'm not a Republican. And um, so obviously they're not talking to me and I don't understand how they think. And this has been a long running theme for, you know, we've been talking over a decade, right? Like I had to try to get it ourselves in that Republican mindset is tough. So I will caveat that the heck. But I will say this. Um, Republicans have historically made a big deal about standing up for the constitution, right? That's been their fetish. They'd walk around with pocket constitutions, right? This is the thing. And Pence went up there clearly with a hostile audience um, and got them cheering, defending the constitution on January 6th. And this is definitely a crowd that was booing uh, Chris Christie because he talked about the, you know, Trump undermining democracy and breaking the law. And they did not want to hear it. And they certainly, I mean, Pence was, it was frosty when he first started talking. But being able to stand up there and say, everybody talks, you know, I am the only person on the stage that has actually defended the Constitution under fire was very, very powerful. And then to have Chris Christie basically, you know, provide this soliloquy about how courageous Mike Pence had been that night and how shameful it is that nobody else on that stage was willing to, 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 to forcefully defend them, which led Nikki Haley to basically defend uh, Mike Pence. There's nobody else that had the, the, the stage rallying around him. And so it was in real stark contrast when DeSantis, in that same sequence, 
was unable to say, yeah, Mike Pence did the right thing. And it sort of just, un you know, just sort of underscored just how scared a campaign DeSantis in running and how much he lacks principles. But Mike Pence was able to stand for something. Chris Christie was able to stand for something. And even Nikki Haley stood for something. And that significantly cut through. And in dial testing of independents, unfortunately, they were independents, not Republican voters. But uh, Magellan Navigator uh, Research did dial testing, which is they, they measure how people feel about the moment. They had literally a dial. And I like this. I don't like this. They loved when Chris Christie was defending the Constitution. They loved when Mike Pence was defending the Constitution. They hated when Vivek talked about pardoning Trump. So again, those are independent, Republican leaning independents. They might vote in a Republican primary caucus. Who knows? They're not exactly the Trump voters that were in that auditorium. But when Mike Pence was done and when Chris Christie defended Mike Pence, that crowd applauded and cheered. And I don't think they were really ready to do that when the whole night started. In fact, they were loving the facts. Um, you know, Trump mimicking shtick that he ran out with from the very, very beginning. He was brash, interrupting people, uh, proudly displaying his ignorance and thinking that ignorance is a political plus. And, um, and by the end of the evening, the crowd had turned on them. So it was, it was, it was an interesting dynamic. And, uh, can I give you one more? Please. Because I think that the biggest takeaway of the night, and it's underreported, people aren't talking about it, the crowd did not care about abortion. If you go look at, they talked for abortion, I don't know, it was long, it was like 15 minutes, right? And everybody trying to one-up themselves over who was most pro-choice, I mean, pro-life, 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 pro-life. The crowd was dead silent the entire time. They did not care. So you have, and even, even Fox's lead into the question was, Abortion is a political loser for Republicans. And then they listed a bunch of races that Republicans have lost because of abortion over the last year. That did not face the candidates. The crowd didn't care. Abortion is an issue. I don't think Republican base cares about abortion anymore. They thought they, they, they think they won. They got what they wanted, right? They got their Supreme Court. They are tuned out. So Republicans are marching off an electoral cliff on abortion. When your audience just doesn't even care, not even their most partisan Republican primary voters at this debate, they don't care. I mean, go back and watch. It is that silent. Nobody cared. Yeah, that that's what, well, well, let me stay there for a minute. The, the audience, why do you think they were dispassionate? They wanted that? to hear about Hunter Biden. They wanted to hear about the stuff that Fox News talks about. Hunter Biden. So, so but, but doesn't that also disclose that the abortion issue has always been sort of a, a, a straw argument for about something they really don't care about? I mean, it's hypocritical. Oh, my God, we've got to, you know, we've got to. I mean, you would think they would have celebrated that win, you know, but it's like. The real purpose for that was to galvanize some in the base just so we could have power. But we really don't care. Uh, it, they, the Christian coalition part of the Republican base definitely cares about that. And they are, they are the bulk of the Republican foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. The mega church crowd, right? Right. And so, no, they absolutely care. I think they, there's a sense of victory. Uh, there's a sense of, uh, we did what we set out to do. I mean, it's just like we fought hard for Obama in 2008 and then everybody stayed home in 2010 because they thought like racism was conquered. I mean, we're done. We have a black president. And <laughs> we all know that that, was the, that wasn't even the first point. That was just like the first baby step. But, you know, people just, they're not sophisticated or they were tired, you know. And, uh, but yeah, before, before Dobbs, that crowd would have been all over. They would have been cheering all that abortion stuff. And they just did not care. And they just wanted to hear, they wanted to hear how you were going to defend Donald Trump. They wanted to hear about Hunter Biden and the Biden crime family and all that nonsense that Republicans are prattling on about right now. Um, 
And abortion is probably the most substantive issue they try to talk about. They didn't care. Yeah, just didn't care about it. So, uh, so some have said, I was listening to some of the commentators who took an opposite view of, of Pence and felt like he damaged himself. I, I think you make a very strong argument. There was some who was saying he damaged himself by lowering himself to engage Ramaswamy so much. Uh, like he's the vice president. Ramaswamy is clearly, he's a clown. And, and just from my point of view, he, I mean, he looked like a buffoon. I, I, and, you know, every now and then Christy throws a good punch and lands when he says this guy looks like he came from chat GPT. <laughs> if I had been, I, if it had been me, you know what I would have said? I mean, he literally looks like one of those fake AI Instagram accounts. It's like artificial yeah, yeah, yeah. intelligence. I mean, he's just, and he was, I mean, he was just, it was just buffoonery. All of the, the smiling and all. I mean, we yeah. know what that is. I mean, and I don't even think he probably didn't even know the history of people of color and minstrelsy, but he was literally acting like yeah. <laughs> a minstrel. This is the, the, the entertainment. Um, but what do you think about that? Did, did, did Pence and not just to mention Pence, any of them, did they, did they lend too much credence to him and give him too much response? Did that legitimize him? Um, so, you know, it's funny cause, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the leaked, uh, debate prep report from Ron DeSantis and right, it really right, adds Ron right. DeSantis to engage with the back. And literally he was the only one on stage who did not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Not engage with Vivek. Right. Uh, the uh, I don't, I don't think they set out to do it. I, I actually think they couldn't help themselves because he was just that much of a troll and that obnoxious. I don't I don't think he he debased himself though. I mean he he used that as his, as a springboard to defend the value of political experience. And there is a there is a there is a thread of of political thinking that that political experience. You know, somebody who's been in the swamp too long, right? It's a bad thing to have experience. It's what drives a lot of discussion over term limits, which you know that that actually being good at or knowing how to be a legislator is a bad thing. Uh, I don't subscribe to that to that view. I don't think an outsider is necessarily better, and particularly not somebody like. Um, Vivek, who, who admitted that he hadn't even thought about foreign policy until last month. And then he's sitting on stage trying to mansplain to a former UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, what, you know, foreign policy is all about, right? And, and so the chat GPT thing was freaking perfect because this guy doesn't know anything about anything. He's throwing out, you know, just random crap. He, he's being obnoxious and. There was, there's a, there's a focus group CNN thing where a bunch of Republican, you know, viewers said that they thought he had won because I think they, it, there, there, there is that sense of, I mean, he was very much mimicking Trump in the whole, like, I don't know anything. And that makes me better than people who know stuff. Uh, and maybe there's a, there's a strain of Republicans who, who, who like that. First of all, I think it doesn't work for a person of color. I mean, I think it, it's just in the end, it's, it's not. Republican Party can't cross that that line and won't for a long time. Same with Nikki Haley and same from Tim Scott, who had a terrible debate, just objectively. Uh, he talked about somebody who just like blended into the wall and disappeared. Yeah, uh, but um, but uh, I, I don't I, I don't think I, I got to say, like Vivek made that debate like fun because he was so obnoxious and I actually was rooting for these Republicans beating up on him and I don't care to see an unfocused group because you can tell in the audience at the beginning, they loved it. Right. Cause, cause he was out there throwing out all the, all these nonsense talking points, uh, and praying that, Oh, now that you're done with your, with your prepared remarks when clearly his were prepared remarks, right? Like it was just, it was just so freaking dumb. By the end of it though, people were, were, were there, were, he was not getting, you know, even with a Republican crowd, when he talked about climate change being a hoax that landed like a thud, um, I got the sense that the crowd had pretty much had turned on him and he had a few moments here and there, but, uh, it seemed like that at the beginning, he might actually have some kind of, uh, of night. And by the end of it, it was just, I think he's what you call him clown. I think it's, yeah. Um, I think that's, that's what he was. He was, he was comic relief. And I don't know if that's really what you're going for. And in the end, and it didn't come up in a debate, right? But he was so, but, in his defense of Donald Trump. Donald Trump declared him the victor because he defended 
<laughs> he offended him the most. Why is he running for president if Donald Trump is so great and you support him so much? Like, where, where, what are you that doing? would have been the obvious question is, then what are you doing on stage? If you think Donald Trump's the greatest, right? why are you up there? A colleague called me earlier this morning and suggested he, he, they may actually be working together. You know, this guy's clearly something on behalf of Trump. He said he wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, that's the, pur the, the purpose he's serving, uh, to actually promote Donald Trump and, and make him look better. Um, I mean, I wonder if he's just trying to get a job on Fox News or, you know, trying to go that route. But, you know, speaking of, you know, one other major point, the abortion one's the first one. The second one, did anybody use the word woke last night? I think Nikki Haley may have used it once. I, yeah. th I think Vivek may have used it once. Um, DeSantis definitely did not. And to, I think it sort of signifies even the, re even the Republicans in their bubble have realized the stupidity of the woke argument because it, we, we may have seen the death of the woke, you know, as a, as a political slur. I think they've realized that it's, it's a big loser for them. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was kind of dumb for them to get in, involved in that in the first place. Um, they never defined it. I mean, polls show that when you ask people what woke means, it just like admit being considerate to others, and that's sorry, Republicans. Most Americans are actually hey, <laughs> being considerate to others. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So now you mentioned Tim Scott. Yeah, Tim Scott. First of all, Tim Scott. I think we all saw last night. He's, he's a very monotone character, a very monotone charisma anyway. And you're in a group of people, you, you, you kind of have to have voice inflection. You have yeah. to show something. You need to go, Ramaswamy is the extreme, but yeah. you, you do have to have, show some type of personality. And you're right, even Pence, who's also a pretty monotone character, at least the things he was talking about were significant. And he's difficult to ignore because this man was, was on the spot. I mean, really. And there's a gravitas to the situation, right? Our democracy is at stake. Right, and right. Or having like the deck screaming around them, like him being calm. Yeah. I thought it was a really good contrast. Like, yeah. okay, this guy's. I, I thought it was interesting too that Pence tried to invoke um, the, the, the immediate past generation of conservatism, saying I was one of those. Yeah. You know, I'll go, I go back to that. Now, obviously, I mean, I don't think he's saying the snowball's chance in hell of winning nomination. Uh, and it also speaks to why on earth he even put himself in a position to be Donald Trump's vice president. But we were, uh, we were reminiscing. I was, uh, I think it was in a loose as race for Indiana. Well, no, that's right. And I was, I was actually, I actually had dinner last night with an Indiana and they were reminding me. And I, if you remember, he had a deadline by which to refile to run for re-election for governor. And he begged, he stalked Donald Trump. He said, I got to do this deadline, man. You need to pick me because if I do this deadline, I'm finished because I'm not going to be reelected. And the Indiana was telling me, they said, not only was that what happened, Trump picked him because he begged him. He begged him to get him off the hook for running for re-election as governor. But yeah, Tim Scott was out of it. DeSantis... I, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm going to ask you a question about Tim okay. Scott. Okay. So um, Tim Scott's actually been about on the ground retail politics in, in Iowa. He's actually been pretty good. And he's sort of been peeping up in the polls. Um, he, he's um, unlike DeSantis who hates people and clearly hates being around humans. Like Tim Scott seems to be comfortable around humans. He may, he may be, he, he talks slow and because, you know, he's got that Southern drawl. And, but, um, one of the ways he, he sort of receded is that a lot of the more aggressive candidates, they, they jumped into the conversation. Even if they weren't picked, they were, they were, they were going to make sure they, they, you know, snuck into that conversation. In fact, was obviously very obnoxious about it, but Chris Christie was a little more smooth about it. Um, even Penn. But, um, Tim Scott did not. And I wonder as a black man in a Republican lineup full of, um, um, mostly, white men obviously you have nikki haley you have Vivek, but the dominant people on that stage you know white men do you think he could have been more assertive or as as you know because we always talk about like obama had to be even killed because he didn't want to be the angry black man 
you think that's something that may have kept Tim Scott back or is it just Tim Scott's just a laid back guy and just wasn't going to walk, impose himself into the debate? I would, I would say this. I think Tim Scott, like most black Republicans, is conflicted. And when you're conflicted and you, and it's really almost an internal identity crisis. The question you're asking me, it's inevitable. He's asking that of himself. What do I do? How do I, you know, and, and, and if you're in that constant struggle with yourself, you, you almost make yourself null and void. I'm, I'm sure he was probably in that moment trying to figure out what to do, what to say, how to approach it. I have not, I don't know how he's presented himself an hour, but I was an hour. He hasn't had to compete with anybody, you know, in terms of having a microphone at his own events, but probably a little bit of it. He didn't want to seem overly aggressive, but at the same time, he knows he has to be seen and heard. He did not, you cannot get points in a debate if you're practically silent and, you know, and, and you're right. There are ways to assert yourself without coming off as obnoxious. I, I'm sure he wasn't prepared, but I think Tim Scott is, is, is conflicted. You know, he's a fish out of water. Uh, frankly, Nikki is too. Th this is, a, this is a party of white males. What do you do with that? I mean, you're yeah. trying, you, if, if, if anything, I mean, to be very honest about it, you're trying to either deceive or manipulate a party that exclusively serves a uh, wealthy white males, not even middle-class, middle-class white males think it does, but it doesn't. No, you, you, they're leaving the Republican Party right, because they're right, realizing it. Right. So, I mean, what what are you doing? So, I, I mean, um, you have to wonder, and I'm sure being in that situation, I'm sure Vivek called a lot of them off guard and he's sucking all the air out of the room for no reason. So, yeah. I mean, in that moment, unless you're sharp, you know, um, you don't know what to do. So, I, I'm i sure he just did not know what to do with himself. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing that really hurt him, I mean, that's fascinating. I'm just... It, to me, it, it, there's, yeah, there's literally, there was something there that I felt like he was held back. He was, you know, it's like a fear there. And I think, I think you're right about that. And the audience must have been 100% white, right? I can't imagine there was anybody of color in that audience. And, um, the other thing is his moment where he was most passionate and most in his element was when he was talking about abortion. And what did the crowd not give a crap about? That issue, abortion. right? Didn't give crap. Didn't well, give crap. So again, like they, there's a whole, candidates that that they think they need to talk about abortion and they and may, maybe they do because again the evangelical um part of the party is the foot soldier part of the party right and Iowa was very evangelical particularly caucus goers so um that's probably a part of the party they need to appeal to but when i mean i'm still just struck about how bored the audience was with that conversation they they they're like give me a hunter by no there's abortion stuff again and they're going to be talking about this tank in their party for the next year when even they can't get motivated enough as, as a collective whole over the, this issue. And this is, this is a real problem. And, and I will, again, I, 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 cause I still can't believe it. The lead in from Fox News was abortion is a political loser for the Republican party. They're not yeah. even trying to sugarcoat this thing. I mean, they, yeah. there are people who realize the danger that abortion puts on the party and they, they just can't they can't avoid it they're like a moss to flame yeah yeah do you ever feel like life is a never-ending series of lessons while you try to find purpose meaning and answers i am vanessa fontana the host of figuring shit out a podcast where we undertake self-help coming of age and healing as i live my 20s in new york city figuring shit out myself i've realized that if you spend your whole life trying to get your act together you don't have a life you have an act on Figuring Shit Out, every Sunday you get to normalize the journey of not knowing and be guided into living your life with more intention and ease. No, he 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 was disappointing. Um, but th the man who everybody had thought would really make a dent in things and and remain a front runner by now, or at least be the biggest threat to Trump, was DeSantis. It, yeah. He was awful, right. and they're even. It was awful. And I can't take, you know, we can't take credit for everything, folks, but somebody online even did an analysis of his smile. And it was like, what is, is that an actual smile? <laughs> Clearly rivers. It's, it's like he had trouble. Rough. So it was Mark, like, Mark, 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 Vivek was like, Mark, 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 Mark. V yeah. Vivek was a Ch Cheshire cat. I mean, he looked like the, the, the stereotypical minstrel smile. That's what minstrels do. They smile. You got to smile, make everybody comfortable. He's just a big jokester. And then DeSantis was like, 
How do I smell? Yeah. You know, it was is that dude is he's not a people person. Did, did anybody? Did anybody talk, I mean, you got to tell people. You know, I argued this a year ago. I was I was ne- no. Well, I will I won't take credit for his collapse this quickly. I actually thought he he would have a moment, and he hasn't even had a moment. Um, but it's anybody who has been watching him would know just what a absolute um disaster of a candidate he would be. You know, I've been watching Tim Scott for a while. I actually thought Tim Scott would, and he may still have his moment because Iowa is friendly. But um, he, I mean, last night really didn't do him any well. Uh, doing didn't do him any good. <clears throat> but um, the Santas really like I I because I wrote this winners and losers post, and I actually had to go on my my company Slack and say, guys, that what did did the Santas do anything today? Like, what did I miss? And they're like, no, you didn't miss anything. I'm like, I mean, like, no, but seriously, like. He did he have one moment where people like were into him, and there was there was literally nothing. It was it was it was um, yeah. It was it. Was, I mean, he didn't like recede into the background like Tim Scott did, but he said words, but none of the words actually landed because they were all they were all lame. And there, you know, maybe his stand up moment, <laughs> his stand up moment in the debate is when the moderators asked. If you, if they would su- raise your hand, if you will support Donald Trump, if he's convicted and he's a nominee and everybody raised her hand except for Asa Hutchinson and then Chris Christie raised it, but he raised it to not because he would support him, but to say that he'd be disqualified, you know, if he was convicted. And, right. Right. But uh, Ron DeSantis in the center because he's the highest poll, you know, poll polling person in the in the race so he got center position he looked left and right to see what everybody else was doing before he raised before he his raised hand. hand yeah yeah and everybody noticed and that was maybe the personification of the DeSantis campaign he is running scared he was not going to go out on the limb either hand up or hand down he was going to go with the crowd and uh he, it, I mean, it's obviously it's way too late for him to sort of project as a leader. Um, and this is why I also think that Chris Christie and, and Mike Pence did so well is that, is that they projected as leaders and, and Republicans like that. I mean, let's not forget that Donald Trump is the personification of moral rot and decay in the country. And he got the Christian coalition crowd to go along with him because they like I don't think Republicans necessarily, they don't, you don't need to agree with them, but you need to show macho, you know, I'm, I'm in charge, alpha male type tendencies. And I actually think Mike Pence shockingly did that. Chris Christie did that. Uh, even Nikki Haley, you know, with her quip about if you, Margaret Thatcher's famous quote that if you want in politics, if you want to hear people talk, you know, you, you turn to men. If you want to, you know, people to do something, talk to women or I mangled it. But that that's the whole, the gist, right? So, um, I mean, Mike Pence, there was even a moment because, you know, Vivek sat there and trashed Ukraine. And um, he was funneling, he was, he was, he was, yeah, he was funneling um, Donald Trump and his attacks on, on Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, you know, called him the Pope. And was dismissive about U.S. aid to Ukraine, and the crowd applauded it because it really is fun. It's it it's this is what Donald Trump's big thing, you know, this pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party is real. And um, Mike Pence turned that around. He made a incredibly strong, coherent defense uh, of democracy and Ukraine's vanguard of democracy and. If Ukraine fails, then Russia, you know, then U.S. troops may have to defend a NATO country next. And Vivek try to be all bro and, you know, mansplain something he doesn't know anything about. And Mike Pence shut him down. And the crowd was cheering Mike Pence and booing or hissing at Vivek on Ukraine. This is a very Ukraine skeptic crowd. And Mike Pence turned that around. Leadership matters. And this is where where um, DeSantis just absolutely falls flat. There's, there's nothing about him that says, I am taking a risk. Let's not forget, 
Donald Trump's at 50% in the polls, in prime rate polls. You're not going to win by playing it safe. I mean, maybe the assumption, maybe he'll die of a, a Big Mac in the next week, right? But clearly, indictments aren't going to stop him. A conviction's not going to stop him. He's going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So how do you stand out from the crowd? And you can't... Donald Trump's support is pretty baked in. There's not a lot of Trump supporters who would consider anybody else. But he's still at 50%. So a divided field, yeah, then... You know, Donald Trump wins easy. But what happens if you can consolidate the anti-Trump vote, which is half of the Republican Party? How do you, what happens? And so how do you consolidate that? You don't consolidate it by being weak. And that's what DeSantis keeps to this very moment. He keeps projecting, looking left and right or raising his hand. That was weak. You do it by projecting strength. And Mike Pence projected strength and resolve. And so did, uh, Nikki Haley. And so did Chris Christie. And, um, is that going to be enough? I mean, I'm not going to. I mean, Donald Trump's going to be the nominee pretty much, but there's an opening there. And on, on this week's episode of The Brief, you know, my co-host and I, we talked about the only way you can really chip away at Donald Trump at this point is you have to have a unified case against him. You have to basically have the field create this counter narrative that Trump, with his indictments, is going to lose the election. And therefore, you need to, you need to, um, a new a new face and while you didn't have a unified voice you had major voices even Nikki Haley took a swipe at Donald Trump so you have the bigger voices in that primary field are starting to gel around the narrative against Donald Trump and and there the history of primary politics is littered with candidates who had their moment in the sun who were up in the polls you know Brett Thompson and Jeb Bush and and Howard Dean and uh, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, once you're at that top, though, what brings you down is everybody else piling on. And that's, that's why in, in presidential primaries, you don't want to peak too early, right? That's like a, that's a danger, peaking yeah, too peaking early. Peaking too early, right, right. And Donald Trump's at the top. It's like, you gotta, you gotta take him on. Otherwise, why are you on, why are you in a race? Like, if you're not running against Donald Trump right now, you're in, you know, sorry guys, Donald Trump's not going to pick you as VP. Like that's what Marjorie Taylor Greene or Kerry Lake are for. Like he's going to Matt Gates. He's going to pick one of his, uh, one of his, uh, rabid lieutenants. Not, you know, nobody in this field. So, um, there was that first step and we haven't even talked about Donald Trump very much, ironically, because that's what everybody wants to talk about. I think his counter programming interview with Tucker Carlson was a big bust. And, uh, I think some like 18 million people watched the debate and, um, I don't think many people listened to the Tucker Carlson and it was pre-recorded. So it was, it was like, it was lame and yeah, yeah, nobody talking about that. not being on stage allowed the field and the moderators to define Donald Trump. And again, when you asked about the moderators, they talked, they talked about the 800 pound elephant in the room or I don't know, something like that. And he talked about his conviction or his uh, indictments. If he was on stage, he could have rephrased, you know, reframed that. But um, instead, yeah, you had Vivek defending him and screaming about pardoning Trump. But you had Chris Christie talk about about um, Trump's indictments. You had Asa Hutchinson saying that he should be disqualified because of the uh, because of the the uh, insurrection clause of the Constitution. I mean. You had a, a, a crowd that, and Trump wasn't there to defend himself. And there is an assumption by Trump that he's got this thing already. He doesn't have to work at it. And again, people in politics, that's always a very potentially problematic, um, position. In 1980, Ronald Reagan skipped a debate against, uh, George Bush senior in Iowa, thinking that he had it in the bag, he was the incumbent, he didn't need a debate. He lost Iowa. And actually that propelled George Bush Sr. to a series of strong showings that actually put Ronald Reagan's renomination in peril. And eventually he recovered and he, he got he was renominated. But you can't really assume these things uh in politics. And particularly since there's so many wild cards with all the indictments and all the information and Mark Meadows flipping on Trump and you got all these things that are happening. So um, him not being on stage, I, I thought was a dramatic um, 
uh, miscalculation and it showed fear and I'm surprised nobody on, on stage, including Chris Christie, accused him of being afraid. Um, they must have poll tested it and saw that it might not have worked well with the crowd. But but because uh, he was afraid. I mean, that's really Donald Trump never skips an opportunity to be on a stage. And, you know, had he been on that stage, because the rules of the debate were that anybody who was mentioned got 30 seconds to rebut. You know, every single question Donald Trump would have been mentioned giving Trump basically half, if not more, of the time to talk. And then he would just talk to everybody and he'd beat Donald Trump, right? So, um, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Like, yeah, I think he does. <laughs> so he, he could, he could have dominated that thing and maybe he'd walk away with 90% support. Like maybe yeah, he could have used yeah. that to lock himself down from 50% to, to 90 right. by showing he was the most alpha of alpha males. But, but instead, he was afraid. Yeah, he did not want to face Chris Christie. He did not want to debate January 6th with Mike Pence. And so there is an opportunity and I would be, I don't know when the next debate is, I haven't looked, but I would be, uh, it'll be really interesting to see if Donald Trump decides to sit that one out as well, because I don't think he can afford to keep giving his opponent a platform to build a case against him without being there to defend himself. And if, if your if you're wingman in those debates is Vivek and, you know, him being his obnoxious brass self, like, oh, no, you might want to think of a new plan. I'm actually surprised that Fulton County is going along with his primetime surrender tonight. I'm surprised they didn't say, no, you surrender regular business hours. Oh, no, they, they, from the beginning, they said it could be 24-7. Okay. They, they said they're open 24 seven. It was very like, we're not, we're not looking for any circus. Really what he should have done, honestly, if um, I would have came in at two o'clock in the morning when nobody was around. Yeah. Done yeah. quietly. I don't, I don't know why he thinks, I, I guess he thinks he'll raise a lot of money from it or anything, but Donald Trump's problem isn't money. But you know, he's he, always about the ratings, yeah. the ratings, the ratings. So he's, this is a TV spectacle for him. Yeah. You know, this is the apprentice or whatever. And so. Yeah, I'm going to do it on primetime television and force all the networks to carry it. So again, because I mean, at the end of the day, his obsession is that lamb like that legitimacy, that yeah. that 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 void that his parents but never felt. It's so weird. He skipped the debate, right? I mean, that's yeah, why it can yeah. only be fear For, to overcome his desperate need to be in the limelight. The I, fear and what's We'll see, let's see, we'll see if he's practiced his poker face this time around. Cause this time it's televised, right? I mean, yeah. they allow cameras and, and all the way through. So in the, uh, we saw when he, when he surrendered in, in, was it in Florida, which where, you know, the, 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 the bailiff didn't keep the door open for him. So slam the door in his face and, <laughs> right, and right. he, he did not look happy. He didn't take questions afterwards. I don't think, I think he's really scared of going to jail. Like he is absolutely petrified of this and he does not have a good poker face. I, you know, I keep talking about that, that rally he had in Oklahoma, you know, in the middle of COVID where nobody showed up. And then he, in, you know, he gets the, uh, you know, his video of him going back to the white house and it's got makeup all over his collar and it, it's all drooping off his face and he looks orange and it's, you know, he's all defeated because of this, just does that remember they had like an overflow screen outdoors because they thought they were going to have too many people and, and they, they didn't even feel like half of the inside. I mean, it was, it was like a big disaster for him and uh, he couldn't hide it. He does not have a good poker face. Um, we'll see if he can walk in there with all smiles thinking that, that like this is, this is to his benefit, but he got to realize this is his, they have a five year minimum sentence. And uh, that doesn't mean he would serve five years. It would mean he would serve some time at least before he'd be eligible for parole. So he has to know that this one in particular is his greatest threat. And he can't pardon himself if he wins on this one. So he's got to be scared. And I am, I'm actually interested to see if, 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 because we haven't seen a poker face before. Like, um, when he lies, he convinces himself, he convinces himself that the lie is real. But you can't lie to himself that he's not in mortal danger right now for going to prison. Yeah. 
And, and I would go at two o'clock in the morning. People right, would wake right. up and go, "Oh my god, he did it!" Like he <laughs> snuck in the back door and at three in the morning, and right. he got arraigned. And I mean, just just watch, Mark. They're gonna they're gonna. And I don't I don't want this to be seen as as fat shaming in any way, but he is obsessed with projecting himself as this virile, healthy man. And he lies about his, his weight and his real weight's going to come out. And, um, I don't think he's going to be able to, he's going to watch the truth thing where he's going to talk about how it's fake news and that the deep state's trying to make him big, you know, heavier than he is. And I mean, it's the weight thing is going to be a thing. Uh, and not because, um, casting aspersions on a heavy man, but because he is so obsessed with it and he lies about it so much that it's going to be an issue. You're right. You're right. Well, let's have some conspiracy fun before we go. So it's like, I agree. He's afraid of going to prison, but he's also afraid. See, I, I've learned when, when you're dealing with like real criminals like that, they're not only afraid of the consequences of what they've been charged with. They know what they did that we don't know. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, there's some stuff that still ain't come out yet. They, you know how you say, well, Marcos and Mark, y'all did this. Okay. Well, phew, they don't know what we really did. He knows what he did that is worse than what we've heard about. He's probably scared of that ultimately being found out. So that's how, why he knows he's going to prison. But then also conspiracy fun, y'all. So you look at like this. You get this video. I mean, who's in position to have perfect timing to film uh, Prigozhin's alleged plane going down, right? That happens like the day before he turns himself in. So that's kind of a Whatever he's thinking about, that's also a reminder from <laughs> from his patron. Whatever is happening with you, you got to hold the line on not giving up any information about me, because this is what I do to people. The plane. I mean, this that's a spiraling. That plane is just zzz, and I'm and I got scared. I went. I was with. I'm in, in Tennessee for the special session on, on guns, which is with the, the two Justins, the Tennessee three. And it is nothing. There's absolutely nothing good to report. Although we had a victory last night, we stopped open carry in schools. That was voted down. Even four Republicans voted against it after several of the mothers from the Covenant School spoke up and reamed, reamed them out. But, you know, uh, but other than that, I mean, you see this plane spinning and spiraling. And then you have to wonder, well, is this also a signal? So I, when I'm out last night, I'm asking everybody. Just I went before we had this meeting, y'all. No one here has made Vladimir Putin mad about anything, right? And they all knew what I was saying. They started laughing because like I don't want to be in here if he's looking for another y'all because this dude is literally taking people out. So I don't want to be <laughs> anywhere around anybody who's got any beef with Vladimir Putin. So I I think that's another that's another something to fear for him. That's got to be a reminder anybody who's on Putin's benefactor list. Best reminder, you got a total line. So, and it's funny because when he when he had to when he had to pay two hundred thousand dollar bond uh, in a Georgia case, he came out. He wrote this really bizarre truth post, truth social post on what do they think I'm going to do? I'm going to take my plane and fly to Russia, 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 and it's you know it's like clearly that's what's on your mind. <laughs> but and you know what? I'd be okay with that. I got to say. He, Go to Russia. Yeah. Oh, get with Philip Talim in Russia. Although now, yeah, you're totally right. Like, wait a second. That might be even less safe for me. Yeah, yeah, ever. yeah. Yeah. No, no, I got, I, I, I'm not even in there. I got scared yesterday. I'm looking over <laughs> my shoulder. <laughs> like, that's just a matter. Folks will take you out. So, yeah. Well, this, this is interesting. So, well, yeah, we'll see when the next one is and, and see how this all unfolds. And of course, I guess everybody out of, just out of sheer curiosity is going to watch this man turn himself in and everybody hasn't turned themselves in. So what's going to be interesting is when the arrest warrants are issued for the other folk. Uh, Cause that's a, when you have a warrant out, they can execute that warrant. You get pulled over. I, for speeding. I would be shocked if, 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 you know, everybody, it doesn't turn themselves in. I mean, it's yeah, that would, the, today they got one more day. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. I would have done it right away. Yeah. <laughs> don't leave that hanging out there. That's embarrassing. I don't think Mark Meadows. Uh, I don't think Mark Meadows has turned himself in yet. Uh, no, he he did the whole thing trying to move it to federal court, and that was just rejected last night. Actually, yeah, the, the yeah, judge, made, right? Yeah, yeah, rejecting his move. So he he may fight it to the last moment, but but I don't think he's gonna he's gonna ignore the 
the um, the deadline. I think he's going to keep filing stuff to try to keep pushing it off. But um, it's it's I got it. Mark Meadows is a whole different story because he clear he we know he he made a deal with a federal prosecutor with Jack Smith. The fact that his lawyers left him open to state prosecution and all of this is is that is legal malpractice. Like when you negotiate a deal like that, you cover all your bases, and clearly they did not. Um, it seems to me that the obvious answer to a solution to this all is he just cuts a new deal, which is probably what's going to happen. I would I would assume. And and right now, what there's eighteen defendants. One thing to, to note that that. Rico cases, these, you know, these, uh, cr- criminal syndicate cases have a minimum five year sentence. And the reason for that isn't because you want these people to serve five years in jail. It's because once you take away the discretion of having a judge give, um, supervision or, you know, just, just, uh, like a light sentence like that, like slapping a wrist by creating that minimum sentence, you basically force everybody to plead out. So the idea isn't to have 18, 19 defendants, you know, along with Trump in that case. The idea is that they're all going to say, like, I don't want to serve five years and they will all plead out except for, you know, I, 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 I'm going to assume that, that Willis isn't going to let, I mean, obviously there's nothing for Trump to plead. Like he's, he's gotta, he's gotta do what he's gotta do. I don't see why Rudy Giuliani would get a plea deal, but everybody else, I'd be, I'd be shocked if um, anybody's left other than those two by the time it's trial time. Because why would they go to jail potentially five years for Donald Trump? I think right. even they aren't that dumb. Yeah, and for something they know they did, it's not even yeah. as complicated as people seem. No. You know, it, you know, it ain't like Law and Order, y'all. It, it's real simple. The jury's instructed: Did A do the B to cause C? You don't yeah. go outside of that box. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to spin it. It's like. It was this call made at this time making this statement? Yes it's or a, no? <laughs> it's even easier than that because mm. they only have to find two criminal acts to to form that conspiracy. And there's what, like 180 counts? of. <laughs> so it's basically a, the entire case. Pick two. Just any two. 178 of them could be wrong, right? Or you don't even have to look. Just pick two and you got five years minimum sentence. Yeah. They will all plead out, and Trump is in real, real <laughs> trouble right now. Indeed. Thursday Coast, y'all. Another Thursday Coast in the books. Check out the podcast, The Brief. Always follow Daily Coast. Become a part of the community if you've not done so already. Get all uh, the latest news, and in fact, uh, the news you can actually do something about. Thank you as always, buddy. Yep. Thank you so much. Love ya. Love you Talk too, you man. Day. All right. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.